Hey guys, welcome back to the fourth episode of the Magic Shooter tutorial. In this episode, we'll be creating enemies. This enemy will be able to chase the player, deal damage, and when shot at, die. We'll be coding this enemy and the structure for the enemy class by hand, but for the actual appearance of the enemy, we have a prefab with particle effects that we'll be using as the base. Go to the prefabs folder and drag the ghost enemy prefab into the hierarchy. You'll see that it's a blue ball of floating particles. If you're interested to see how this was made, feel free to mess around with the particle system and learn more about it. There's a few components that we want to add onto this prefab. The first is a rigid body and a sphere collider. Remember that the rigid body allows physics to be applied to this object and the sphere collider will create collision around the enemy. For collisions to be registered, both objects that collided need colliders and at least one of them needs a rigid body, since one of them has to have been moving and affected by physics to collide. We'll set our sphere collider to have its center at the origin of the enemy and its radius to be one. Now, we have a script that we wrote that we'll be attaching onto this enemy, destroy in X seconds. It's essentially a timer on how long the enemy can exist in the game before it'll disappear. This way, the stage doesn't get too cluttered. We'll set this to 60 for now, but you can change it to whatever you want. Next, we'll create a script called enemy controller that will control the enemy. This will go inside an enemy folder inside the scripts folder. The first thing we want to think about is what we want to be our editor variables. Things that we want to be able to modify in the editor for ease of access. A few key things that come to mind are health, speed, and how much damage it deals. So we're going to create edit variables for those where health is going to be an int and both speed and damage are going to be floats. We want a separate variable that will keep track of the current amount of health that the enemy has because we don't want to modify the variable for the maximum health. So this will be a private variable. Remember our naming conventions from episode 2 in case you don't remember why our variables have prefixes to them. We'll create an initialization region where we want to set the enemy's current health to its maximum health. We'll do that in a wake so that it happens right when the enemy is created. Next part that we'll focus on is enemy movement. The enemy will follow the player around no matter where the player is. To do this, we'll have the enemy track the player's position and move closer each frame. This is similar to how we did the camera movement. We need to keep track of two things, the player's position and the enemy's rigid body. The rigid body will go inside the cache components region and the player's transform will go in the cache references section. The cache references section is a region for components that we'll be creating variables for, but belong to other game objects. In this case, this script will go on the enemy, but the transform that we want is a player's transform. We'll prefix these with CR underscore. Now we need to assign these two variables. To access the rigid body, we'll do it the same way we did with the player rigid body by calling get component in awake. We have a few ways to get the player's transform. One way is to search by a component. Another is to search by name using game object dot find. And the other is searching by tag which is a way to label objects that we'll get to soon. All of these are rather costly, so we'll do it only once and we'll do it inside start. We do this in start instead of awake because we want to make sure that the object exists before we try to find it. All awake functions will be called before any start functions will be start to called. So we can guarantee that the player controller and the player object will already exist by the time we call start. Since we only anticipate one object ever having the player controller script attached, we can take advantage of that 
and find the object with a component of player controller. The function for this is find object of type player controller inside angle brackets. This will return the first game object that has the component player controller. Since we want the transform, we can just call transform at the end of that function. Like with the player, we're going to move the enemy using the function rigidbody.moveposition inside fixed update. The position that it's going to be moving towards is the player's position. To make sure that it doesn't go too quickly, we want to establish the direction that the enemy is going to move, be moving towards by subtracting the player's position from the enemy's position and then normalizing that so that we can apply the movement speed onto a unit vector. The final vector that we pass into move position is the enemy's current position plus the product of the direction vector, the speed, and the time.fixed delta time. This is the same math that we did with the player movement, minus the rotation math, because one, the enemy is a sphere of particles, and two, we don't really care what direction it's facing. Now we can try it out. Attach the enemy controller onto the enemy object, and we'll set the variables for the enemy as max health equal to one, speed equal to one, and damage equal to one. We can move the enemy away from the player a bit and hit play. As you can see, the enemy follows around the player wherever it goes. Now that the enemy can move around, let's set up a way for it to damage the player. But we haven't set up a health system for the player just quite yet. We'll get to that in episode eight. For now, we'll just have the game reset when the player loses health. In player controller, we want to create a new region called health functions. This will be used more in episode eight, but for now we'll just create one function inside it. Decrease health. We don't need this right now, but to prepare for the future, this function will pass in a float for how much damage the player is going to take. We said that we would want to reset the game when the player takes damage. To do that, we can just load the current scene again. Scenes in Unity are like different stages or levels. If you recall, we have two scenes right now, one for the main menu and one for the arena. Loading each will take you to either the main menu or the arena, respectively, and you can load them at any time to go to that specific one. We're going to be using a Unity package called UnityEngine.SceneManagement which we'll put at the top of the player controller script. This package allows us to call functions specific for transitioning through scenes. So inside decrease health, we're going to call scene manager .load scene. Inside this, we're going to be calling the name of this current scene. To make this more applicable in general, we can access the current scene by calling scene manager .getActive scene .name. Now in enemy controller, we want to call this decrease health function whenever the enemy touches the player. The enemy won't really have an attack per se, but it does contact damage. To do this, we're gonna take advantage of the collision system. Colliders have a number of methods that will be called when something with colliders comes into contact with them. These are on collision functions, and the main ones are on collision enter, on collision stay, and on collision exit. On collision enter is called on the frame that colliders touch each other, and likewise, on collision exit is called the frame that two objects separate from each other. On collision stay is called every frame that the two objects are touching, and that is a type of collision that we want here. When on collision stay is called, a collision object is passed through, and this is the object that is colliding with the enemy object. We want to get the game object of this collider so that we can access the rest of its components. To do that, we call collision.collider.gameObject. Once we have the game object, we want to make sure it's the player, since anything that collides with the enemy will trigger on collision stay. To do this, we're going to use tags. Tags, like I mentioned before, are a way to label and categorize objects. They can be found underneath the name of the game object. Here, you can see that we have a list of tags that we can attach onto the player game object. Normally, you'll only have the first five when you start a new project, but we've provided the ones that you'll need here. If you do need to add a new tag though, you can click on add tag and add it there. Likewise, we'll tag the enemy object with the enemy tag. We can check the tag of the object by using other.compare tag player. If this condition is satisfied, we know that there is a player controller component and we can get it to call decrease health 
and pass in the amount of damage that we determined beforehand. Now back in the editor, we can hit play again and see that when we hit the enemy, the game resets. Since the player has a way to die, we should also give the enemy a way to die. In enemy controller, we want to create a health methods region and create a function called decrease health as well. Like with the player decrease health, it would decrease the amount of ha health that we have, but we'll go over the health system in episode eight. So for now, we're just gonna destroy the enemy as soon as it gets hit. We can destroy it by using destroy game object, where game object with a lowercase g refers to the game object that this script is attached to, like using the keyword this. When the enemy dies, we want to have a new particle effect happen where the enemy will explode apart. We've already set this up for you. You just need to instantiate it. Instantiating is the creation of a new game object. So if you remember, we can create new objects in the editor by right clicking in the hierarchy. And this is a way to create new objects in code. It will take a game object, a position and a rotation that it will spawn into. So in the editor variables, we're gonna pass in the particle system that we've already set up as a prefab as M underscore death explosion. We want to call this to show that the enemy has died. So it would go and decrease health. Something to keep in mind though, is that we can't put it after destroy because if we do, the explosion will never be created because that part of the code will never be called. Destroying an object also destroys all components on it, including this script. So before destroy, we want to instantiate the explosion object at the enemy position and at the identity quaternion. Back in the editor, we want to find the prefab for ghost enemy death and attach it to the variable for death explosion on the enemy. However, we have no way to test this out right now since we can't deal damage to the enemy. Just for the purposes of testing that our method works, let's change the code really quick. In enemy controller, let's change the on collision function so that the enemy takes damage whenever they run into the player. I'm going to comment out the line that calls player's decrease health function, and instead we're going to call the enemy's decrease health function. Effectively, the enemy is damaging itself whenever it runs into us, but we're just doing this now to make sure that our enemy death works. If we hit play, we can see that when we run into the enemy, the game no longer resets and the enemy will explode on contact. As great of a game as this would make with the player being invincible all the time, now that we've verified that it works, we're gonna reset the code back to the way that it was. But don't worry, the next thing that we'll be working on is a way to defeat enemies without cheating or making ourselves invincible. As a review of this episode, we set up an enemy game object, its movement and its attack. In the next episode, we'll set up the class and structures for creating attacks for the player. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next part.